Hello, bon, bon, bonjour, good afternoon. Welcome to Simon Gives Bad Career Advice, an artist talk with the great Simon Barrett. Um, I guess I should say a few words about the man you were about to, I was about to say about to see, you're seeing him right now. Now you're back to seeing his, his photo. Um, yeah, so Adam is a terrific American screenwriter, uh, largely recognized as Adam Wingard's writing partner. Uh, he's written the scripts for such films as Horrible Way to Die, Your Next, uh, VHS, The Guest, Blair Witch, um, Dead Birds. Uh, and yeah, now he's just completed his first feature as a director as well as a writer, uh, the film Seance, shot in Winnipeg, uh, photographed by Kareem Hussein, and it will be upon us soon. Uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to turn the virtual stage over to my dear friend, Simon Barrett. Uh, okay, that was a good start. That was a good start when like I came in awkwardly and then like <laughs> went away again, because I feel like that sets the tone for, for really what we're about to enjoy here today. Um, so, you know, so look, the format of this is, is you know, when, when Mitch and Fantasia reached out to me uh, to do a talk, uh, I kind of, you know, was thinking about what I could actually say, uh, limited number of subjects that I can fill 90 minutes on to say the least, as you're about to discover. But um, it, it occurred to me that like the thing in a Q&A, remember, you know, if you've ever been to like one of these festival Q&As, you know that you know usually one out of every three screenings there will be someone who stands up in the audience and you know like like asks a question that's like you know i've been working on my script uh, about my summer in prague for 15 years and everyone in the audience kind of winces and you know looks at their phones or starts just like surreptitiously cutting themselves through their pants pocket and it's just like this awkward moment where the questioner kind of makes the q a about themselves so what I wanted to do is uh, try to do a Q a Q and A that's entirely about the kind of questions that I feel like I get asked a lot that people are either too shy or correctly uh, too filled with shame to ask in public. Now, and I suspect, uh, so I get these questions a lot, and and um, for a long time I couldn't figure out why because it just felt to me like if you were going to ask someone for career advice, um, you know, on the internet where you can act pretty much access anyone, you know, I always wondered like, why wouldn't you go to someone successful? Uh, you know, but then I realized perhaps, uh, perhaps that is my appeal. Uh, cause I've been on the internet, um, due to, you know, my various personality disorders, uh, a lot for a long time. And when Adam Wingard and I were first starting out, uh, you know, I wrote a few a couple scripts during a weird time for the industry, which I'll get into a little bit. Um, and then when Adam Wingard and I started making very, very low budget, you know, just a couple thousand dollars at first uh, films together, um, I was pretty vocal about, you know, like being uh, very poor and 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 kind of having, you know, uh, you know, Adam's from Alabama. I'm from a small town in Missouri, kind of having. Um, you know, not really any access to, you know, what felt like the film industry at the time. And, uh, you know, I was pretty vocal about, you know, at, at least kind of feeling like an outsider. Um, and so I think maybe that's why people ask me questions. That's like the flattering answer. The unflattering answer is this, uh, like people just ask everyone and, and like, I'm, I'm just like on a list somewhere of people who will reply. But, um, but you know, I, I do kind of want to, uh, you know, to just address the viability, first of all, I guess, of asking people career advice on the internet, um, which normally is, is, is very low. And that's why this talk has been dubbed as such, because I, I, I can't give any good career advice. No one can, but I can at least attempt to kind of explain how I got to a point where I'm able to make a living doing what I do um, and, and, and address that through, I think, other people's questions. So I'm gonna primarily just kind of start diving in and uh, Jean-Francois, uh, lovely uh, Fantasia tech person is, is standing by um, and he's going to explain to me how to answer these questions. I do want to just, I'm just going to start out with the two questions I've already been asked in our Q&A, even though I've had a, several submitted to me online. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm, I, okay, I'm, I'm, this is like watching, probably very much like watching an aged relative. Um, and I apologize for that, but uh, you know, we talked about having a moderator and decided it would, might be uh, not 
sufficiently awkward. So the first question uh, from an anonymous attendee appears to be a wellness check request on Ty West, um, asking me how have I heard recently from Ty West and how he's doing it. I'm just going to get that out of the way first. Ty's fine. Uh, the problem with when filmmakers leave Twitter is everyone seems to assume they're dead, uh, whereas in fact they're just experiencing slightly greater mental health. Um, you know, this, I get this a lot with Adam as well, of course. He's doing okay, too. Uh, Ty's doing great. He's, he's got a new movie in the works, I hear. I haven't seen him in a while, but he's directing a bunch of TV. He's doing, he's doing fine. So I feel like I did a really good job of answering that question, and I'm going to click done. Answered one. This is going really well. Okay, the next question, unfortunately, is a harder one. Do you ever read scripts from young green writers from Adrian? Uh, the answer is yes, I do, but I probably shouldn't, and, and, and I'll get into that. Now, mostly what you'll discover when you are emailing scripts to random people online or asking them if they'll read your scripts um, is you're not going to get a lot of positive replies, and, and, and you know, there is slightly a good reason for that, which is like, say I'm working, you know, for two years. Oh, thank you, Jean. Um, uh, someone just said something nice in the Q&A. That's not what it's for, Jean, but Jean, Jean, Jean. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming everyone is French, who I'm talking to. Um, at any rate, no, 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 it's cool, it's cool, it's cool. Um, anyway, uh, I appreciate it, thank you. Um, I'm looking at these things, though, is the, is the point. Uh, I am listening. Um, so the issue, when people say, like, I can't accept an unsolicited script, what they mean is basically like, say I've been working on like a killer robot script for a year and you email your killer robot script to me unsolicited. And then like three years from now, my killer robot movie comes out and you're like, you know, what the fuck? Um, that's the issue it is, is this notion that like, if you send me a script online and I read it, and if there's ever any similarities down the road, which obviously there wouldn't be because I, you know, I'm not going to be ripping off people's scripts, but like it, it can, it, it, it's, it's, there's kind of no plus for, for, for anyone to do that other than discovering a nice, great script. But uh, unfortunately I, I feel like I should be writing my own. So it's a tricky thing asking someone online unsolicited to just read your script. Uh, I'm also extremely busy and constantly feeling, you know, being a professional writer um, means always having anxiety about the sense that you should and could be working more. Um, being a non-professional writer is the exact same thing. Um, just you're poor and you have anxiety about that as well. So I'm not complaining. I'm, I'm quite fortunate and quite lucky um, to be where I am right now. But, it, but I do always feel like I am neurotically way behind on everything I want to be doing and I'm not achieving enough. And so, um, so I, I don't, tends to be excited by the prospect of reading uh, scripts by people I don't know. And, and it's just a tricky thing because, you know, what does that, so what does that give you, you know, like, like that's not helpful. And, and I don't mean to start this off on such an unhelpful note, but I kind of did want to dive into that because that tends to be the elephant in the room for a lot of people, which is like, oh, how do I get, you know, someone who could get my movie made to read it? Um, and, you know, we'll dive into that more and more, but, but the general method of just kind of, sending it to someone like myself for feedback. Look, I can barely get my own films made and everyone you know is kind of in the same boat. Unless like, unless you're a very famous filmmaker, you know, it, it's, it's a struggle to get, especially if you want to make like original movies um, and you don't just want to do the kind of franchise thing, which um, every time I try my hand at it, uh, audiences are, are infuriated. So I kind of want to do the original thing a bit more because um, that still seems to infuriate audiences, but then like two or three later, two or three years later, they discover the movie on Netflix and feel better about it. So I feel like I'm on the right path there, but it's hard to get those movies made. Um, you know, Seance took me I think five years to get financed and it's not a huge movie, um, but you know, getting people who would kind of have faith in me uh, as a director, um, just based on kind of my producing credits and stuff took a while. So. In general, uh, when I get scripts, I feel guilty because I don't know what to do with them. Um, and I like, and that's pretty much it. Um, I can give, you know, notes, but I don't think people really want my notes, uh, which we'll get to as well. Um, Kat, I already had your question. Uh, I, I'll get into all these. So, so that's a tough one. So I, I like, I will occasionally read scripts just from people that I've interacted with um, and try to give them helpful notes, but you know, it's, it's a tricky thing because even if I read a script that's amazing, 
I don't really know what to do with it. Now, mind you, I'm not even talking about the fact that I live in a country and city that is um, currently uh, like not sure what the future of like film or business or the world is. Uh, we can get into the whole COVID of it all. Um, uh, that some of that remains to be determined, but uh, we can get into more of that too. Because I actually do think, by the way, that what we're going through right now, it, this kind of seismic change in the film industry and what the theatrical experience is going to be um, and what films are going to be uh, is changing, not in a, you know, obviously insane, like quibby way, but in a like, you know, potential, like, you know, the theatrical experience might become more of a niche specialty thing. And I do think there are actually a lot of opportunities for up and coming filmmakers right now. Um, certainly, I think kind of maybe more than there ever have been um, because there is a desperate need for content and not a lot of people who know how to create it on a budget, which is basically how Adam and I got our foot in the door and filmmakers like Ty, um, who you know we've collaborated with. Um, so, you know, that's the short version is, is you know, I'm gonna always be kind of pushing people to create content rather than um, content that like, like it, but meaning like a short film or a feature that they can make with just themselves and their friends rather than a script. Which brings me to another question. Um, do I prefer to write or direct? Well, like that is not really, uh, I definitely prefer, uh, I, I wouldn't say I'm a happy person, but, but what I would say is that uh, for the purpose of this talk, the reason I got involved in screenwriting, of course, is just because you can do it for free, right? Um, you don't need friends or anyone, you just need, you know, like, a, you know, a piece of paper, basically. And directing is expensive. Um, you know, I, so I went to college, uh, I went to film school, um, which is a question that I used to get asked a lot, but I, I maybe I answered it confusingly often enough. Um, I did go to film school and it did help my career, but I don't recommend that anyone else do it. And the reason for that is essentially that I think filmmaking technology has changed so much in basically the last 20 years since I attended college that the reasons I felt like I needed to go to uh, an academic setting to get the hands-on learning that I did are kind of moot now um, in terms of how movies are actually made. I, I kind of, but on the other hand, what is that, you know, that's not necessarily helpful guidance to a like, like 17, 18 year old kid, you know, graduating from high school, not sure what the next step is towards becoming a professional filmmaker Film school seems like a very obvious and and like organic next step, um, but you know unless you're going to unless you're going a crew path and you want to be like essentially a department head, in which case I think colleges you know there are a lot of the LA schools that set you up really nicely. You're not going to necessarily get anything out of the film school experience other than meeting people interacting with people who basically are as confused as you and share your goals, um, which can be valuable. So my first script that I sold was a script that Mitch mentioned that was called Dead Birds. And it was probably about, it was, I'd written over 20 feature scripts at that time. Cause like I said, I, I, I couldn't make films, uh, but I could do it for free. Uh, and I'd majored in actually cinematography. I, 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 my, my major was actually photography, but I concentrated in cinematography thinking I was basically going to have to figure out how to shoot my own movies. And that's kind of what I wanted to, to know how to do. Um, I assumed I'd be shooting on basically 16 millimeter because, um, again, it was the 90s, uh, late, late 90s. Um, but, uh, but, you know, like so video was was happening and I kind of knew, you know, a little bit how to edit on an Avid, but I really wanted to learn how to make real movies that knowledge was obsolete 18 months after I graduated, like instantly irrelevant. I, 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 I suppose I'm glad I have it because it allows me to have conversations with people like Kareem who shot Seance, um, where he's forced to have to pretend to respect my knowledge because I can differentiate between lenses and so on. And I understand the basic process of optical printing, but you know, really that's just it. It just helps you kind of talk to your crew members. 
And so my first script uh, that sold, however, was my first ho low budget horror script. I'd written a bunch of scripts, but they were, you know, crazy, ambitious, weird, you know, attempts at like essentially like the great American novel and like screenplay form, um, except, you know, like way worse than anything you could conceivably imagine. <laughs> like just horrible, 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 uh, horrible scripts, um, which, you know, is another key piece of advice that is given often. Uh, and I, I do want to reiterate this because I think it's true, which is, you know, you should write a lot. If, if you want to be a professional screenwriter, I do believe you should be generating, you know, about four, three or four feature length scripts a year, you know, kind of at minimum just to kind of hone your craft. But you should also understand that like the first several you create, you're gonna think they're really good. They're gonna be really bad. And you won't realize how bad they are until, you know, five to 10 years later. Um, and you just have to like know in your heart uh, that probably it's bad and, and you should do another one um, until you really start to, to start to really feel very confident um, about what you're doing. Because, um, because I do think there is so much just trial and error involved in the process. Now I could be wrong. Your first script could be amazing. Um, in which case, you know, how do you get it made to a film? In my case, I reached out to a friend from film school I wanted to cast in this movie, thinking I was going to probably make this low-budget horror film myself. Um, he happened to have just gotten a job basically working for Sony, um, and he was just like, you know, we probably would make this, but you know, there's no way you could direct it, um, but we'd probably like pay you for the script. And I was just like, well, that's obviously better than the thing that I was proposing. Like, let's talk more about that. I did get paid. I got paid thirty thousand dollars, which was an incredible boon at the time. Uh, really you know, kept me, made, made, it, made it like, so that I could continue to stay in Los Angeles. And I was like, this is great. I'm a horror screenwriter. Um, now that took place during the kind of DVD boom, you know, Dead Birds premiered at the Toronto Film Festival in 2004. Uh, this was a like kind of terrible time for cinema, but everyone was making money. Um, meaning that basically if you made a movie for 10 million or less, you could sell enough DVDs worldwide into Walmarts and such that you'd make a profit. Um, this is, you know, the era where we got things like Theodore Rex and uh, that amazing Sylvester Stallone film, I See You, um, which I think is still the most expensive directed video movie ever made, though this year is probably gonna give that a run for its money. And, you know, we were just getting like, but, but it, was, it was this like weird product, uh, you know, that all the studios were just like putting out there that was really targeting kind of the lowest common denominator and it was an era that filmmakers like um, Adam Wingard and myself particularly did not thrive in because we didn't know how to make, you know, the, the movies that were doing really well during this era, you know, were movies like, like you know, like Adam Green's Hatchet, which sold like some insane amount for Anchor Bay. Um, and then Anchor Bay bought Adam's and my movie, A Horrible Way to Die, which sold like two DVDs, um, you know, and were totally flummoxed. Um, that that system didn't work for our depressing art film, but it, it, you know it, it was it was movies that could be like really concretely kind of marketed as being like one thing, um, and then you know, ten years after that, there was really no DVD market, and that's how I basically got Dead Birds made. Is someone was just like, oh, like I don't really like see what's good or bad about this, but it's a cheap horror movie, and and if we make it, we put enough stars in it, we can sell it for you know X amount, and they did. Um, and then that got me, uh, then I got hired to write Frankenfish, which premiered on the Sci-Fi channel. And I got paid $12,500 for that. Also a really good amount of money for the work I particularly, uh, I delivered on that film. Uh, although I was proud of it at the time. Um, so, so uh, and because this is going to run on YouTube, I should make sure um, that I, I, I am being... Uh, you know, like, like, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not disparaging, you know, any of these projects, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of, of my work on them, but, uh, you know, I, I also know I did a really bad job. Um, but, you know, I, you know, I, you're always getting better. Um, so, you know, so that's kind of how I got my foot in the door is through a film school connection. And that was like a completely random, strange thing where I sent him the script. I was like, I think you should play this character. And it's kind of like, yeah, like, you know, like, um, ultimately, I think Mark Boone Jr. played that character. And he was just kind of like, you know, I think we can actually get this made, but we're going to partner you with like a director and it's going to be this like, you know, negative pickup thing for Sony, essentially. 
And, you know, I'm extremely grateful, uh, you know, that I, I had that good fortune, but it also, you know, doesn't make any like sense. Um, because then on the set of Dead Birds, that's when I met uh, my good friends, Adam Wingard, and also uh, Evan E.L. Katz, uh, director of Cheap Thrills and Small Crimes, um, who, uh, who, you know, is, has become a really good friend as well. They did a set visit because they were making the film Homesick, um, I think up near Birmingham, and we were shooting down near Mobile. Uh, Mobile. Um, but uh, they came to set to do a set visit for Fangoria. This actually established my relationship with Adam really clearly because, you know, it's a Fangoria day. So, of course, we, you know, we'd saved our big gore shot for the Fangoria journalist, which turned out to be Evan. So, you know, we, we all, it was fine. I just hung out with him um, and we all, you know, became good friends. But, you know, we basically stayed up till six in the morning waiting for the special effect, um, and, you know, and you know, we're all sitting at the monitor. I had nothing to do. I was just the writer. I didn't know what I was doing. Alex Turner was directing that film. And, you know, he came to the monitor and the gore effect happened and it was horrible. It was a total disaster the way they always are. And, you know, he just kind of, I remember Alex just kind of walked away and. I was just like, like whoop, there it is. And uh, since then, uh, that is, I think, I feel like I've been at a monitor next to Adam Wingard uh, sharing a like look of like exhausted uh, horror um, as we watch something fail to uh, achieve our dreams for it, um, you know, a, a, a couple thousand times. Um, but, you know, so, and then, you know, a few years after that, Adam and I went off to my hometown in Columbia, Missouri to make A Horrible Way to Die, which led to VHS, which led to Your Next, all those, all those filmed uh, entirely or at least in part in my hometown of Columbia, Missouri, um, where I just knew we could get a lot of resources for free. Um, and Your Next is really the film that uh, allowed me to pay off my debt and uh, buy a car, um, which I, the car is still doing well. Um, my previous car was not. So, you know, so that's how film school worked out for me in this very tangential way. So I feel like a hypocrite telling anyone not to go to film school or not to go that route because I did go that route and it was successful for me, but I also don't feel like I directly gained anything from that. And I think it's changed in the time since. Um, I'm going to move on to another question though I failed to answer that one. Uh, I think I actually failed to answer a couple in there. Um, yeah, I think I failed, I think I failed to answer a couple questions at once. So I kind of think we're doing pretty well. Whew, I saw the devil. Should I talk about I saw the devil? Um, I don't really know what's happening with I saw the devil. Um, I, I do want to address that because that was announced several years ago that Adam and I were attached to remake, uh, the beloved Kim Ji Woon film, I saw the devil. I get asked that a lot. That's another really common one. So I might as well get that out of the way, even though it has nothing to do with the topic of this discussion, but it's one that I can answer quickly. Um, I really don't know what's happening with that. You know, we had it set up at a studio at one point. They were concerned about the amount of violence in it, um, which honestly, I kind of felt like I'd watered down from the original film. Um, to my knowledge, Kim Ji Woon was pretty excited that Adam and I wanted to take it in a different direction, um, that it wasn't going to be like the same as, as the original kind of Korean film, that we wanted to do something that kind of used the basic premise um, and went somewhere different with it because it's kind of hard to beat I Saw the Devil. I mean, among other things, those Korean movies shoot for like, you know, 100, 200 days. I think the shooting schedule for I Saw the Devil was something like 190 days, which um, to compare that, you know, the shooting schedule for like, you know, Your Next, I think was like 20, 20, well, it was 27, but that's because we ended up doing three days of reshoots at one point to fix the opening title. But, um, but you know, so that, and that was like, that 27 days is actually pretty, long robust shoot which is something i'm going to get at shortly which is you know obviously shooting schedules have shrunk so much uh over our lifetimes um that the you know the way that movies are made now is is much less kind of forgiving than the way they were made before but i again i kind of think that might be an opportunity rather than uh you know a detriment for any kind of filmmakers who are starting out so um so yeah, so basically, uh, I kind of forgot what I was talking about. Oh yeah, I saw the devil. So um, yeah, I don't really know what's happening. You know, it, the problem with I saw the devil is essentially gets in this larger problem of basically independent filmmaking versus studio filmmaking. Um, it's very hard to get a film made and the bigger the budget, the harder it is to get made. Um, if it doesn't have like Avengers in the title, uh, no one would 
text me a question, right? I don't know. Um, it's, it, you know, basically, I don't think there's a way we could do the I Saw the Devil remake justice without a fairly decent budget, just because the first film was such, the original film is a fairly big budget film that had, you know, the two, like, you know, I guess, you know, really two of the biggest stars in Korea at the time, Choi Min-sik and uh, Lee Byung-hoon. And, uh, you know, the fact that you feel like to do an American version properly, you'd have to do the same thing. Done. So that's hard. So we basically need a studio to come on board for that. And that becomes a complicated thing because then they're like, hey, uh, this movie is about like people killing each other in horrible ways for about two hours. And then, like, yeah. Um, so, so that actually kind of leads nicely into uh, something I, I, I want to I get into kind of the notion of um, original someone basically asked like the difficulty of original versus you know a adapting adapted material and uh for me honestly the biggest issue that i have with adapting material in addition to the fact that it's not my own and i i do feel like you have to have a lot of respect and awareness to like you know the pre-existing fandom and you know look i'm the same as all of you you know when i hear like i saw the devils getting remade my first thought isn't like yay my first thought is like oh fuck why are they doing that like the first film's pretty good you know why the fuck would you know don't don't give we don't need i don't need a saccharine version of this that forces me to like constantly equivocate for the rest of my life which i saw the devil i'm referring to when i reference it as a, being a good film um it's like the time traveler's wife syndrome right you know it's a really good book but now you, it's hard to talk about now because everyone saw the trailers for that movie and it just makes you feel kind of embarrassed to say that it's a good book, but it is a good book. Time to his wife is a good book. It's, it's sad. It's a nice romance. That's Simon's book recommendation, kind of a little bonus for you all. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, you know, I get it. If, if Adam and I make, I saw the devil and we fucked it up terribly, then for the rest of your life, you'd have to say, Oh, one of my favorite movies is I saw the devil. No, not the bullshit, uh, American version, but the good Korean one. And this is kind of an overall challenge. I mean, Adam really faced this with Death Note, especially um, dealing with, you know, a property that had a built-in, you know, manga anime fan base, which had very strong opinions about what they wanted anything related to that property to be. I didn't have anything to do with that film. So uh, I got to sit that one out. But, um, but you know, like Blair Witch was, was an eye-opener, um, you know, realizing that, you know, what I wanted as a fan was not what maybe other people wanted um, and so, you know, so because of that, I kind of, um, I just am very cautious about it. But the main thing is adapting something requires a studio. It requires someone to have bought the project. It requires money to have been spent against it already, which means I'm already coming in, in a difficult position. They're going to have strong opinions about what I do because they've already spent X amount of money acquiring the remake rights to this thing. And, uh, that, that tends to be that can be stressful, but at the same time, that's kind of where the money is, right? You know, um, I don't have really any desire to work on kind of big franchise movies, but I'm also, you know, extremely fortunate that I could even make such a statement because it, you know, it certainly beats all the prior jobs I've had in my life. So, you know, so I don't know. It's it's a it's a lucky problem to have. The challenges are somewhat inherently obvious, uh, but you know, but the main thing is you're talking now about a studio job versus something you can kind of do on your own for your own creative reasons. Um, and, you know, look, an agent is ultimately what's going to get you the former. And one of the other big questions I get asked all the time is about representation, um, agency and man management representation generally is what people mean by that. That's another tough one. I've never had an agent or manager get me a job that led to a film being made. Um, and I think with only two exceptions, uh, both of which I feel very negative about and were really negative experiences, I haven't had them get me any paying jobs, period. I don't have an agent and I haven't had an agent for many years. Um, and the main reason for that is that I just don't know what they do. Um, we'll see if I ever figure that one out, but they're not really gonna help you. Like with a lot of things, um, you know, for example, if like, if you were say you're trying to get a movie made for a like hundred thousand dollars, 
you can kind of it, it, it's it's tricky because you know in theory that's easier to get than you know 10 million dollars right to make a film but both are kind of equally impossible if you're broke you know right like a hundred thousand dollars isn't any more achievable than 10 million you might as well be asking for 10 million um if you can't get either and you're only going to be able to get kind of the level of agent or manager that you no longer need meaning that they will only come to you when you've already achieved a level of success that is precisely the level of success that they can enable you to remain at um but in my experience, they are not able to ever elevate you. You kind of have to do that yourself. And again, I've never, I've truly never, like, like if you look at all my credits, not a single one of those started, uh, including Blair Witch and I Saw the Devil. Both of those were just because I, you know, knew the people involved at the companies and they had a meeting with me uh, and, and Adam and, you know, Adam and me in both these cases. And we're like, do you want to do this? And we were like, you know, in the case of I Saw the Devil, we actually had like like a pre-existing <laughs> like like film that we wanted to make because uh, we were such kind of obsessed with that movie and also A Bittersweet Life and The Good, The Bad, The Weird and stuff. Um, in the case of Blair Witch, you know, we were friends with Eduardo Sanchez and Greg Hale uh, from doing VHS2 with them. So we were like, well, we don't want anyone else to do it. So yes. Um, but, but our management literally like found out about those deals when we got contracts sent to us. So, um, you know, so I don't, I, I know it's really tempting, especially if you're in the middle of nowhere, um, you know, which is where I assume a lot of people who are kind of asking these questions are um, and, and where I myself kind of am from. Um, I know it's really tempting to kind of want an agent to to fix this problem for you. And I, and I know it happens. I know that people like, you know, Ari Aster comes out of kind of nowhere with Hereditary. And uh, I mean, he made that amazing short film, but like, you know, like suddenly his first film is, is, is this like 10, $12 million feature that's really good. Um, so sometimes the, the kind of film school to agency, to movie, to career trajectory can happen. Um, but the reason you're listening to me ramble and not Ari Aster, well, there's like two or three reasons, but one of the most obvious ones is, is that wasn't my route. Uh, I had at least 10 years of abject failure of trying to make a living in the film industry and working a day job and sucking at it. And that's hopefully is giving me the lessons that I'm trying to impart. So, you know, film profitability has changed because there's no video market anymore, right? There's no DVD market like there was. And, you know, the VHS DVD market that allowed all these kind of indie movies to flourish and find an audience, these cult movies that we all adore is, is essentially gone. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I don't see how it could conceivably come back although i am an avid collector of physical media um you know i don't really think that it like makes sense um if if that if that is uh if that clarifies anything and of course now we are looking at the dwindling theatrical market so kind of like in america itself there's really no middle class for movies anymore there's just like huge movies um, which largely star, you know, superheroes uh, or are like these weird surrealistic remakes of like vaguely remembered Disney movies from your youth. Um, or, uh, or, you know, there's the stuff that can be profitable on what limited returns exist from VOD sales and streaming sales. And really the budget for those where it starts to get dangerous is pretty low. Um, you know, it's, it's like a million million dollars, uh, you know, about, uh, and depending on the company, it's less or more, you know, the amount of, of, you know, so basically in, you know, say 2005, you could get a $10 million movie made. And if it was even remotely acceptable as a film and, and, and especially if like, you know, Bruce Willis is sitting in a chair and a shot, so you can put him on the cover, um, you know, or something like that, then you were definitely going to make your money back. Whether that was a good movie that should be made and whether it would lead to a career is a different conversation. Um, Adam and I only started to thrive when that stopped making sense and people were looking for people who could make movies so cheap that they were definitely profitable, which is how we got a horrible way to die financed for ultimately about $80,000 was the budget of that film. But it was like, okay, if we make a movie for under $100,000, if it's at all releasable, it will be profitable. 
And it was, so not nearly as much as you would think. Um, I think we sold that film ultimately for about 300,000 uh, worldwide. So, you know, I think, I think Adam and I, we each ended up getting about 25 grand from that. Again, you know, 25 grand, nothing to shake a stick at, but that was three years of our life. <laughs> Like, you know, we absolutely would have made more money, um, you know, forget like, you know, working at Starbucks or McDonald's, we would have made more money like picking up beer cans on the side of the freeway. So, uh, so, you know, so, but I had a day job, Adam had a day job, Adam was basically living on my couch, didn't have a car, we were able to edit the movie in my living room, we were able to do it uh, just by being cheap enough that people felt they, that we were a safe investment. Um, which is kind of where I'm going with a lot of this, uh, but you know, but I, I will hopefully provide some sort of wisdom in between that trajectory. So I, I kind of do, you know, I don't want to discourage anyone from making movies right now because I, th I think it's like a, a better time than ever in terms of the technology that's available. I am extremely jealous of the filmmaking technology that's available to aspiring filmmakers. Uh, you know, my first films were shot on a Bolex uh, that a friend of mine borrowed from uh, uh, RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, shout out to them, they did get their cameras back. Um, but, uh, you know, and I literally, we were like, you know, cutting it with like a flashlight and like a razor because we didn't have like, you know, uh, any kind of flatbed editing system or a moviola or anything. Um, now, you know, it's just like, you know, you got your, you got your 4K camera right here. Um, on the other hand, there's no acoustic record of how absolutely fucking embarrassing and awful all of my student films were. And I'm so eternally grateful for that, that all my student films were made on a medium that like just sits in a closet and degrades. That is exactly where those films should be, if not actively on fire. So on one hand, so on the other hand, I'm very lucky. You, you, you younger filmmakers face tremendous opportunity, but you also face just an ocean of shit that did not exist when I was coming up, um, which is to say, like, it's so easy to make a movie right now. Um, and the, the extent that you have to compete with um, things on YouTube and such is, you know, alarming. And uh, I, my production company, which doesn't produce anything, I, I just I have a loan out company. It's, uh, it's called Two Squirrels uh, Productions because at one point I saw a zoetrope of two squirrels riding a bicycle. It was like one of the earliest moving images ever created. And I was watching this little cartoon of two squirrels riding a bicycle. And I was like, this is more entertaining than just about any film I've seen in film school. Um, I'm really engaged by this. Like they were on the pedals, you know, each, each pedal had a squirrel. So I guess their weight was evenly distributed. And like, I guess, you know, the, the illustrator's theory was that each squirrel was kind of using its body weight to thrust itself forward when it reached a certain trajectory. Could have watched this thing for hours. So the modern equivalent of that is, let's say, like a 30-second YouTube video of a bulldog riding a skateboard set to Yakety Sax. How do you compete with that? It's pure entertainment. I could watch that a million times. I'm, I'm getting excited thinking about what I just described because it's so entertaining. Uh, how do you compete with that? Well, I mean, the answer is people always need movies. People, our brains are driven towards narrative. It's how we understand the world. We're always gonna need things to leave our apartments and do and going to like glare at a movie while your soul's being sucked out of you um, by commercial entertainment is pretty high up on everyone's list. I love the theatrical experience. Um, I can't wait. And I'm, <laughs> I'm absolutely one of these people. Uh, the reason that I'm not allowed into your country, Canadians, is because um, like, most Americans, I'm an irresponsible uh, play glemming who genuinely cannot wait to get into a theater to see Tenet. You know, I'll wear my mask and distance and such, but I really do want to go to a movie theater again, um, which is probably why uh, like people from my country aren't allowed to travel anywhere right now. But, you know, let's not examine that too closely because New Mutants is opening too. So we have our uh, we have our movie going cut out for us. So you know I love I love doing this, and I feel like it's not going to go away because people are always going to need things to do. I don't necessarily think you know VR or AR are going to necessarily place this from a long term storytelling telling in our lifetimes. Which realistically, how many years do we all have left? Thirty. 
30. Um, so, you know, uh, in my country, it's like 20. So, you know, like, like, so you got to kind of keep that in mind too. There's a ticking clock. Um, I definitely answered something in there. When your next premiered at a decade ago, at Tiff, I'm, I'm just picking questions at random now. I shouldn't do that. Okay, I'm going to start at the beginning. Kat, you asked, uh, having a good United team casting crew is essential to making a film. Talks about how I work. Okay, great question. Thank you, Kat. Um, the, and you can always raise your hands and stuff. I'm, I'm going through your Q&A questions, but uh, Jean-Francois is standing by if anyone wants to ask anything on mic. I don't know why you'd want to do that to yourself. It sounds really stressful. Um, but if you want to do that, uh, if you prefer to speak rather than typing, um, I'm available. I will notice when you raise your hand. I will instantly kind of get nervous and freak out, and then Jean-Francois will come in and fix it. Um, so finding a creative team. This is the number one thing that I truly believe everyone who messages me for advice should be doing. Um, it's not that simple. And as a fairly introverted, introverted person with, as you're probably perceiving over the course of this talk, like not always the greatest social instincts. Um, I really get that. I really get that. Um, I really struggled with this in my early career. Um, part of that was quite truthfully uh, that I, you know, I was just kind of an obnoxious person, I think. Uh, and I, you know, I had a chip on my shoulder and I thought I was really talented. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know why anyone would want to work with me under the circumstances like that. Um, but I had a uh, wonderful weakness, which is that I majored in photography, uh, in cinematography shooting film, which was one of the worst things to do. Now, I do want to point out that I got into film school uh, more or less for free uh, because I, I did, uh, although my grades in high school were extremely poor, uh, I think my GPA was like 2.3 or something. It was like, ludic I was a ludicrously bad student in high school. My test scores were quite good. Um, and even though I, I ended up having actually uh, having to leave high school early to go work full time at a factory, um, which is when I really realized that I needed to work in the film industry because I, 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 it was clear that I wasn't cut out for anything else, um, that I had no other manageable skills. Um, worked full time at a factory for about nine months. That was depressing. That sucked. That was like getting up before the sun came up and like getting out after the sun went down. Um, not fun. It was actually more like a warehouse type situation. I say a factory to make it sound more melodramatic. It was a warehouse, but it was still really depressing. And, um, you know, so I wasn't even a full-time student, but I had decent test scores. So I was able to kind of parlay my way into a couple of schools that, uh, that, that were willing to take me. Shout out to the college. Uh, maybe, I don't know. I don't feel any loyalty to them. So, um, you know, like I knew how to shoot film, but I couldn't, I didn't know how to shoot video. Uh, every time I tried to shoot video, it ended up looking like the bride of Frank, you know, like, it, it, you know, I, or, uh, Maybe trash humpers is a better reference for the for 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 the modern Fantasia crowd. Um, you know, like horrible, but but not intentionally so, like like Harmony Crane was doing, um, if that makes sense. Uh, and so, meanwhile, Adam Wingard's over here in fucking Birmingham making these movies in a weekend with his friends that just look like incredible. Um, and so, I really quickly like was, you know, sitting around with Adam and Evan and Adam's like, you know, we should do a movie together. And I was like, yeah, actually we really should. Cause I'm trying to figure out how to do stuff for no budget right now. Cause nobody's giving me any money and I'm like running out of time. Um, you know, before I basically have to like move back to my hometown and try to figure out how to mix a drink, um, to make a living. Um, and meanwhile, I think Adam was like mowing cemetery lawns. It was something like equally, our, our lives were equally dramatically depressing in, in, a, in a like, you know, way that sounds fictional. Um, I was doing, I, I worked as a licensed private investigator, which is, um, you know, just a weird little resume thing. I did that for 10 years. I'm still licensed in the state of California. And that was a great job for, for an up and coming filmmaker, but it wasn't a great job for a human being necessarily. Um, so I shout out my former company. I don't think they'd like that very much. Um, in fact, I think I've signed several things saying I will never do that. Um, but uh, that said, uh, you know, it, had, it afforded me some flexibility while, while, while slowly crushing my spirit in the way that jobs do. Um, so, you know, so I found, like, it was obvious to me that I needed a collaborator, that as much as I thought I was this amazing all-in-one filmmaker, editor, DP, you know, I can do everything. 
Uh, in fact, I could do very little. Um, and I was honing my craft increasingly just as a writer um, and, and losing my abilities to shoot and edit. And meanwhile, Adam's over there making like a feature every month, you know? And so that ultimately led to what fun we're having, Fantasia premiere and A Horrible Way to Die, a Toronto premiere. And that ultimately led to your next. But that was the beginning of my team was Adam and I realizing that between the two of us, we'd actually made some friends over the years. You know, we could reach out to Joe Swanberg and Amy Simons and, you know, and, and we cast a lot of like Adam's friends in that film. We shot it in my hometown. Uh, our location budget on that movie was $100, which we spent at a diner because we went over it and they had to open while we were still filming. So I bribed them $100 uh, and uh, everywhere else we got free. And, and you know, and, and I, you know, it was a horrible experience that, that made me want to kill myself. And then, you know, it turned out to be one of the greatest experiences of my life, which is pretty much filmmaking in a nutshell, um, which is you're just like miserable and exhausted the whole time. And then as soon as you recover, you're like, I gotta get back on set. So, um, so you know, I really, that, that really is it, is finding those, those collaborators. And, uh, you know, I'll never take in a film by credit and notably uh, Adam on the films where we collaborated together doesn't, if they don't say a film by Adam Wingard, um, you know, because I think we, we both kind of felt that it was, you know, it, we, we were making a team effort, you know, you're next. Um, in particular, Amy Simitz, Ty West, Joe Swanberg, um, Calvin Reader, to the extent that he's in that movie, they're all doing a tremendous amount of improv. Um, I put the script up online and kind of ultimately so people could see what they're doing. But it's like, I mean, I'm willing to take credit for their good work, and I and I have and I will, but I don't want to take too much credit for it. At a certain point, you have to draw the line. So finding a team, finding collaborators. Now, of course, this is an industry that mostly attracts, uh, you know, psychopaths. Um, so, you know, you're going to have a hard time um, before you find a team like I did. But as soon as I kind of found, you know, these people, you know, I, I was like, that was when my life kind of started to turn around because um, I realized I, I could contribute something meaningfully to, to, you know, what Adam was doing and so on. So, you know, it's not always going to be that simple, but I mean, it took a long time. So I do really recommend, I, I'm, I'm, I'm running... I'm rambling a little too much here and I apologize. Um, I haven't watched the other talks. I bet they're a little more focused than this one. But like the number one thing I would really encourage everyone to do who wants to make movies is just see, like look around and see what you have. Uh, I hosted a screening of the amazing Ted Pryor, David Pryor collaboration, starring Ted Pryor, uh, Deadly Prey at AFI one year. And David Pryor uh, couldn't make it. Unfortunately, he did pass away a few years after the fact, which um, I'm sorry, I never got to meet him in person. Ted Pryor, however, was living in Southern California and he came to the screening and he was a little concerned because he hadn't done this sort of thing yet. It, his, his films hadn't kind of started having screenings yet. So he didn't really know what he was getting into. And he proceeded to give the best q and I've ever seen because it was a room full of AFI students, meaning not to be like, not to, not, to, not, to, not to have the old Simon chip on my shoulder, but largely kids that could afford to be there. And, and this is, you know, a, a, a guy who with his brother made, you know, 30 plus movies ranging from varying degrees of, 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 of it, you know, kind of insane quality, but they certainly, you know, delivered on what they promised. And he just spent the entire time just being like, like people would tell them that it was it was great. It was like it was like what I've always wanted Q and A to be, which is he just quickly went into film like school mode, and he was just like, like what what's your project? Like what are you trying to do with this film? No, 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 no. Like do you have a truck? Make a movie about a truck. Like and I was like, that's actually good advice. Like like that actually was like, that actually is what I wish someone said to me, which is look at what you have around you to make a film. I mean like like to make a real movie like. What would it take to film your script? Because I can tell you that I don't read a lot of the scripts that are sent to me and I, and, and I don't have time and I don't think it's the right avenue. But I watch all the short films that are sent to me because it's less of a commitment. Um, and you know, you just, you just kind of never know when you're gonna see something special. And, you know, and I'm not as worried about, you know, someone saying, you know, the, 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 the unsolicited legal ramifications thing of watching a short film is, is less obvious because it's kind of out there for the world to see, right? It's not this, like he said, um, 
she said, no, I, I guess that, you know, I don't know if we need to rephrase that terminology. I kind of parsed that one in a while. Anyway, it's, you know, it's not just like my word against someone else's that my script isn't like their script. Again, I've never had this problem. I don't know anyone who has, but this is what your lawyers tell you to, to tell people when you tell them that you're not reading their script. It's less of a factor with a short film because you can just be like, oh yeah, I didn't rip this off. Look, here it is. Um, so, you know, so I really, really encourage everyone, you know, to, to, to look at their friends um, and find out what, you know, what, what you can get. And I don't think this is new advice. I think this is probably like the same advice that like, you know, people like Robert Rodriguez and Lloyd Kaufman were giving in their books that I probably should have read. Um, but, you know, but it is, it's true. I mean, it really is like a thing. Um, I think I answered that already. Um, the guest is such a great script. Dan Stevens, how do we cast Dan Stevens? Oh, well, I mean, Dan Stevens was the only person who thought our script was good. <laughs> um, it's, it's a really true thing. Uh, uh, the casting in Adams and My Films is more often than not, we just discover that people actually think our scripts are, are you know, I'll write a script, I'll show it to Adam, Adam will be like, this script is very funny. I'll say, yes, I agree, it's very funny. And then we'll send it to our representation who, you know, are horrified um, and, and definitely don't think it's very funny. And Dan Stevens, uh, who's, who's become a friend, uh, you know, and, and I suspect we'll be working with both Adam and myself in the future because we are just, we just do get along really, really well. And we have a very similar sense of humor. He just got it. Like, like, like no one got the guest and, and Dan, Dan just got it. And we were just like, like, you know, at the time that we met him, he'd just done Walk Along a Tombstone. So he'd gone from Downton to being like emaciated because he was playing a heroin addict. And we were just basically like, how, how, how miserable are you willing to be uh, for the next six months? And, and he, the answer was like pretty miserable. So, so, so he, he was our first choice. Uh, the issue with Dan, casting Dan and the guest, honestly, was more um, convincing uh, our, our, our financiers that, that he was that character. Um, but fortunately, uh, fortunately, he, you know, he's an incredible actor. So that wasn't that difficult. Um, casting is hard. Look, casting is, is the hardest challenge uh, for all, all my projects still. I would say genuinely Suki Waterhouse, who, who is, you know, like a fairly fascinating person um, and, and extremely erudite, you know, got the humor of seance on a level that like no one else was was kind of close to. So hopefully uh, you'll uh, you'll be asked, you'll be equally confused that someone agreed to be in one of our films uh, when that one premieres. When your next premiered at TIFF a decade ago? Okay, great question, Sean. So when your next premiered at TIFF a decade ago, the audience was told it was specifically written for the Midnight Madness crowd. Um, that is true. And specifically what had happened, and this is something I want to really also emphasize, so you're talking to me right now or, or listening to me talk while you, you know, do other things on the internet, I would hope, uh, through Fantasia. Fantasia has slots to fill. And of the big five kind of sales festivals, which are usually identified as what, like Sundance, Venice, Toronto, Berlin. There's five of them. So, uh, can, can. So, uh, basic, thank you, Mitch. <laughs> Mitch typed can. Um, so, so all those, uh, I, Berlin and Venice, I don't think do, but, but can, uh, Toronto and Sundance all have midnight sections. And this is obviously a weird year where, um, we have a plague that my, that, that we Americans think is kind of fun, but everyone else just seems to be kind of over. Um, and uh, festivals are a very different thing right now as we're all currently enjoying. But in a general year, and let's assume for the purposes of answering this question that society will once again return to normal and I'll once again be able to uh, enjoy a terrible movie with all of you in a theater one day. Um, these festivals have, you know, give or take 10 slots to fill, midnight movies. And really how many good midnight movies are made in a year? The answer, I think, is less than 10, fewer than 10. Um, <laughs> now, I hate everything, um, everything, including, uh, including often my own work, which uh, I think um, to work in the film industry, you have to have kind of a unique 
combination of a total confidence with a lack of utter lack of self-satisfaction, um, meaning that you have to believe what you're doing completely when you're writing it, because otherwise you just won't be able to finish a script uh, sitting at home, you know, in front of the screen. Um, but then as soon as you're done, you have to be like, oh God, I can do much better um, and, and be open to that kind of criticism and notes process, because that's what it is. I actually wish if I taught a screenwriting class, which I will only happen if everything else in my life goes wrong. So let's just put that aside as, a, as purely hypothetical. But if I did, I would do a class that's just, that's just notes. Like I would do a class called No Positive Feedback where like people were never allowed to say anything nice about each other's work. Just because honestly, like that's, that's really the process of being a screenwriter in Hollywood is learning to take notes and no matter how fucking terrible that note is, like, 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 and like, like, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing the soul of your project, like ripped out of its chest and devoured, still beating in front of you by like an executive who's got like, you know, a brand new Metallica shirt tucked into like John Bravado's pants. And you just have to kind of nod him like, mm, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. And you know what? I'll give that a try. Cause that is the right answer. Cause the truth is it can't always be better. And maybe the note you're getting isn't the right note, but that doesn't mean it's perfect. And, and, you know, things can always be better. And I tend to, you know, Adam and I both tend to kind of work on our things until the last possible minute, you know, until we kind of have to be dragged out of the editing room or away from the script. Um, because you, you're always kind of trying to hone things to, you know, to kind of a better place. So yeah, anyway, that was, that was a bit of a, a bit of a digression from the midnight thing which is, uh, I do tend to be fairly harsh on things, but I genuinely don't think people are making midnight movies in general, because a midnight movie has to be a fairly specific thing. It has to be short, because otherwise you're up until 2.30 um, watching a Q&A uh, that, you know, is rambling on and on, and you feel like you can't get up to go to the bathroom because then the filmmaker will see you. Um, not a problem with uh, the new world if, if things continue this way. Um, but what I would say is that there are spaces to fill at major festivals like Sundance and Toronto and Cannes, not so much Cannes, their midnight section is a little like, just like, oh, here's what this big director did this year. Um, but the others are really truly about like discoveries and, 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 and films that need distribution. So let's just say, you know, at the big five film festivals, they need, you know, 30 or so midnight movies and there just are not 30 midnight, 30 good midnight movies a year. They need to be short. They need to deliver a certain kind of fun content. And, uh, and they need to kind of like be entertaining. And critics, especially festival critics, tend to be, how to phrase this? Um, people, critics, you know, tend to be more forgiving of films that are not trying to be entertaining because, you know, it's possible that they're doing something very ambitious and interesting. Um, they're less forgiving to films that are trying to be entertaining with good reason, unless they star um, superheroes and then they like them, but it's a complicated thing. I'm obviously speaking in extreme generalities here, um, but you know, these kind of fun midnight movies are not always being made with a great deal of like intelligence and love. Um, but like specifically, Adam and I made A Horrible Way to Die. It was what we could do at the time. We were proud of it. We called it A Horrible Way to Die, which was my title uh, for the script from draft one. Um, partially to get attention. And the end result was that our film played places like Fantastic Fest. Um, and we got to basically watch an entire, like just an entire audience realize they were not gonna be entertained over the course of, you know, 90 minutes or so. Like 90 minutes or so you could just see the, you could just feel the energy leave the room as people uh, realized that, you know, this, that what they'd gone to see uh, kind of expecting maybe like a slasher. Uh, at that time that A Horrible Way to Die came out, we were kind of still in the, um, I mean, torture porn is a, is, is a pejorative word, but we were still in an era of what Colin Geddes, uh, beloved Toronto Midnight Madness programmer of many years, uh, described as movies in which women are tied to chairs, which I've always thought was really, you know, it, it seems oddly specific until you see a bunch of these films. And then you're like, oh yeah, it's another movie in which a woman is tied to a chair. Um, and so specifically, your next, I wanted to do a home invasion movie where a woman wasn't tied to a chair. That was like my first, that was the germ of the idea. So I was like, let's just see how far I can get before I have to tie a woman to a chair. Oh, the end. That worked out. So, um, you know, not to say anything, you know, obviously there are a lot of good movies in which women are tied to chairs. 
none are leaping out at me, but I, I'm sure there are a lot, I mean, quite a few. Uh, Reservoir Dogs, it's a guy. And it, anyway, um, so, you know, so that was just this era of like kind of extreme cinema. Um, like I remember in particular, uh, a Horrible Way to Die premiered at the same time, like the same year, there was a Korean movie called Bedeviled. There was uh, Darren Bowsman's Mother's Day's remake. And there was another movie, a Spanish film that was kind of all like, kind of like irreversible as all one takes. I think it was released as Kidnapped. Um, and they were all like very extreme and, and, and kind of in your face home invasion films or actually Bedeviled was a rape revenge film. But, but we were kind of, I remember being like somewhat lumped into the category with these other movies because our film did have some extreme content, but then people would watch it. It was a boring art film about addiction. It was a more, it was a mumblecore movie. I mean, we were looking at mumblecore movies, um, these, you know, movies that Joe Swanberg and the Duplass brothers and Greta Gerwig and people like that were making for, you know, under a thousand dollars and the performances were incredible and the characters were incredible and they had these sublime moments of truth, but the films had no beginning, middle or end and were insufferably dull. And, um, you know, basically the, the epiphany of A Horrible Way to Die, you know, which I guess you could say was the epiphany of the puffy chair, because um, that preceded it, the Duplass Brothers film. Um, but for me, it was kind of like, well, what if you applied this approach to character and performance to, you know, to a film with an actual screenplay that has an actual kind of horror narrative? You know, it's a way to kind of marry what to me was like the direct-to-video low-budget aesthetic um, of people who are making, you know, kind of outside, you know, outside the system, direct video kind of be uh, horror movies, you know, the Scooter McRae's of the world and so on, um, you know, who I think is, is a great filmmaker. Um, and, and, but to me that, to me, like what Scooter McRae was doing over here um, was oddly close to what like Joe Swanberg was doing over here. Um, you know, it's just like one was all concept and one was all performance. And, you know, it really was like, you know, if we could get someone like Amy Simons to be in our movie, then we would have this like this interesting artistic thing, um, which we did. Uh, but it, but again, watching it was like having your teeth pulled um, and, and audiences made that clear to us. And so after the world premiere of A Horrible Way to Die, I went to the world premiere of our friend's movie Insidious, um, written by utterly good human being, Lee Whannell, and directed by uh, equally wonderful human being, James Wan, who've been utterly unnecessarily supportive of Adam and me over the course of our careers. Um, and so I was drunk as shit, and I staggered into this premiere with, uh, <laughs> with a friend who I who probably I won't call out. And, um, and, uh, and, you know, just watched, like, you know, watched the audience basically riot because they were so entertained. And it was just like, well, fuck, this is what we need to do next. Like we made our movie that technically is a movie. <laughs> um, now it's time to make something that people actually enjoy. And, and there is such a market for this. There is such a market for genre films that are entertaining and, and have an interesting message, which I would say at the very least you're next in the guest. Adam and I, you know, had things to say. Uh, we just didn't want to hit anyone over the head with them. Um, which we definitely did not. But, you know, like the guest, I mean, we, we never talked about the guest, but I mean, the guest tested terribly. I think it tested like a 27 or something. It was a disaster. And one of the main notes we got when we test screened it was that it was specifically disrespectful to the troops. Um, this was when Obama was president. We were trying to pretend, uh, you know, the kind of attitude in America was that actually um, everything was good um, and all the things that we do uh, were good and not bad. Um, so it was kind of a different time. Um, you know, we were bombing, you know, our usual amount of countries, I'm sure, but, uh, but, you know, we were pretending that it was for, um, better reasons than why we were bombing them, you know, four or five years prior. So, you know, kind of a weird time. Um, and, and we did change the film, um, because, you know, a, I, you know, because we didn't want to be hitting people over the head with like an anti-war message or anything else, you know, but we, we knew what, you know, all these movies like Stop Loss and then the Valley of a Law came out and made no money. And then like, you know, American Sniper came out. It turns out that's the story Americans wanted to hear was that actually things are things are going great and, and everyone is bad uh, who's not us. Um, and so we were kind of trying to squeak this in, you know, this this kind of like there's a bit of a message, but obviously in a very silly way and we're just having fun. And, and you know, like we didn't think The Guest was a midnight movie. It was the funny thing. We did our The Horrible Way to Die and we did our midnight movie, You're Next. Obviously the VHS films are very much midnight movies, except the first one was too long. Um, but that's why we tried to get the second one shorter. 
Um, and, uh, and then the guest we thought wasn't a midnight movie. And then Sundance was like, you know, you guys really like need to analyze your own work. Um, it may be in a different light because, <laughs> because, you know, this is ridiculous. And we were like, well, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's ridiculous. Like, like, like all movies. And they're like, no. Um, anyway, uh, but yes, I really, really, really encourage all of you to look at the, look at the market, look at the festival market. They need movies. Um, they need good movies. Uh, I love all these festivals, but the greatest thing about them is you will see the best movies of the year and you will see the worst movies of the year. Like, like that's the greatest thing. Like, uh, and, and, you know, I've probably had my name on both. Uh, at various times in my career, though I, I obviously always endeavor for the former. Um, so, so you really look at like the market of what you're going to make. Like, look at what festivals need. Um, instead of asking me what I think you should be writing, ask Mitch. Uh, in fact, I'll just post his email address. I'll just do it right. No, don't ask Mitch. Don't bother Mitch. But, but, but be aware of what what you're seeing. What and 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 when you go to a festival like Fantasia, like you're attending right now, um, <laughs> uh, you know, like look at what's playing. Look at what's playing and, and always think about what people are not doing. Um, in the case of your next, it was really like there was a, there was a, like, we did a horrible way to die because we're like serial killer movies sell. Uh, we feel like no one's really done anything different, you know, since like, you know, David Fincher's Zodiac and Seven kind of established the two molds of what this is. Obviously, earlier films like Henry, um, you know, did different things in, in Monster as well and, and certain great movies like that. But like, you know, we felt like we could sell a circle movie. In terms of home invasions, we just felt like no one was doing any um, that weren't um, kind of punishing in the same way that Funny Games was satirizing back in 1997. So a void was perceived. Um, and, and I always encourage you to do that. Like, like look at what, uh, look at the bad films that are coming out now and, and ask yourself, how would I do that differently? You know, like, 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 okay, there's a market for this. If you don't like it, what would you do to change it? And, and I don't think the answer should like always be one that seems like so explicitly like, I don't know, like, like morality driven as, as, as ours with like your next where we just wanted to do something that was a totally different film. But, uh, but you know, I do think it's obvious. I don't know. Did that answer that? I feel like I answered that. Um, what do you do make of the diminishing middle ground between any productions of big budget movies? I answered that. Sweet. Racking them up. Um, what do I make of it? I mean, I, look, I think it's, I, 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 I don't think it's good for cinema. Um, I don't know that I love a world in which we have, you know, only superhero movies uh, or, you know, mumblecore movies to choose from. Um, but I also get why this is happening. I mean, you know, when in movies now have to appeal, like, like, so let's say, Back in the day, the average Hollywood executive saw the potential audience for a film as being like a kind of like vaguely dim 13 year old, which is about right. That's that's generally who they're kind of picturing, you know, so when you turn in a script and, you know, they'll say like, yes, but would a vaguely dim 13 year old understand this, they won't use those words. Uh, but that's that's what they're asking. And, and you know, and, and, you know, in the case of those films, the answer had better be yes. Now the question is, like, would would you know vaguely dim 13 year old get this across the world you know because like now for these movies to do well they have to do well in like every culture regardless of like certain you know regardless of what that is or the, comp the complexities that and of course you have the hollywood executives now trying to guess what people want in china and um and and you know i would say that the thing i find the most frustrating about occasionally working in the studios and, and this doesn't apply to any of my projects, but I have had to deal with this on projects that haven't come to fruition. Um, you know, like or hate Blair Witch, that, that was our movie. Like the studio wasn't telling us really what to do. They had an idea, but we thought it was a good idea. That movie was made with a lot of love and respect for its fans. Uh, I get why they were, why they were just annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> and why nobody wanted it. But, you know, genuinely, I can say those executives had their heart in like, the right place with that film, you know. Uh, but I have been on projects where, you know, the sense that your viewer is not as smart as you permeates the conversation. And, and I think you're better off assuming that your viewer is smarter than you and trying to, you know, excel 
past your own limitations to create something uh, good because the studio process is very condescending. And now that it's kind of, you know, these blockbusters are trying to make be these things that appeal so globally to, you know, a, a theatrical market uh, for that huge opening weekend, it, you know, it, it's hard to get interesting ideas across. And, um, you know, it, I don't think it's necessarily, uh, you know, good for cinema, but, you know, cinema, we've got bigger problems. So excited for Seance, when you directing, when directing performances is from Steven, directing performances, what do you struggle with the most and how do you work past it? Ugh, directing actress is a whole other conversation. Um, I, uh, I think I don't, it just depends on the actor. I mean, the truth of the matter is a good actor can make a bad line of dialogue sound amazing and a bad actor can make the best line of dialogue in the world sound terrible. So, you know, when you're on set and you're trying to capture these moments and you have say 22 shooting days, um, you know, and you have a lot to get through, uh, like, like crazy stuff and stunts and gore and, and, you know, um, you just have to capture these little moments that, that will work, you know, when assembled, I'm, for me, it's what I, I, I'm, I like, and maybe this comes from working with people like, uh, Swanberg and Amy Simons, who, you know, very much kind of understood acting on a much higher level than I did, uh, certainly at the time that I was working with them, but I'm, you kind of really have to be open to whatever your actor's process is, because at the end of the day, you know, they're the people that, that are going to make it work. You don't have to be nice to them before or after the shoot. You know, if you, you don't have to hang out with them or be their best friend or anything. In fact, I, as a director, I tend to, and as a writer producer, I tend to make myself fairly scarce, um, you know, because I want my actors to, to like and respect me, which I think, you know, my best option in that situation is just having them not see me very often, except, you know, when I'm working um, and uh, not when I'm, you know, falling apart as a, as a human being, which is whenever I'm not working. Um, so, you know, so I, you, you, like, I think that's the rule of thumb. I mean, with Seance, I had a, a young, younger cast, um, mostly young women, uh, a lot of people from the Winnipeg theater scene who had, you know, a very different, like, acting methodology than, like, L.R.A. Smith, who, you know, uh, you know, we cast in the film who'd done a lot of, like, TV work, or Suki, who'd done a lot of work. Uh, both of them had done a ton of modeling work. So they were very, like, they could be directed very specifically in terms of some of their physical movements, um, but, you know, but like, you know, in terms of their approach to kind of lines and character, I was very much like, you know, what do you want? What do you need here? Um, and, you know, you work with different people. I mean, like, um, you know, we kind of discovered on your next, for example, that, that like Sharni Vinson, uh, also a wonderful actor who I'd love to work with again, um, is amazing. Uh, but she's very precise. She wants to know what her lines are. Every day would start out, I'd sit there, uh, in, while she was in the makeup chair having blood poured on her and we'd go through her lines and she'd say, eh, I think I should say this. And I'd say, and eh, eh, maybe this, and we'd go back and forth a little bit. And she, cause she wanted to know precisely what the lines were. And then she would kind of have to sit there sometimes while everyone else did their improv. Uh, and, you know, because of that you had to be careful. Cause you know, say maybe, maybe like, you know, Ty is warming up and Ty's takes are just getting better and better, but Sharni's getting a little frustrated <laughs> that we're just letting Ty ramble. And so, you know, past take seven or so, she's getting annoyed, but like Ty's sweet spot is gonna be take nine. And so, you know, you kind of have to figure that out. You have to kind of modulate people's energy and figure out what their methodology is. I shouldn't uh, disparage Ty. It never took him nine takes to get a line right, but I figure he can take it. Um, so anyway, just ask your actor what they want. Ask your actor how they want to be directed, uh, listen to them. Uh, and if their answer is totally, totally wrong, <laughs> find a way to work around that. Any advice on licensing music? I'm thinking about the guest. Uh, Adam has a big philosophy that I have adopted as my own. Uh, although now that he has big budgets, it's interesting that it's changing. So uh, like the music that's in uh, Godzilla versus Kong. I, I, oh. Anyway, uh, like, you know, he, he, in terms of our needle drop stuff, we initially had an approach that was, we didn't ever want to use anything that people would have prior associations with. It was kind of a way of getting things that we could instinctively afford, right? But, but you know, if you if you just pull the um, who's another person I can pick on because they're way more successful than me, Wes Anderson, uh, a filmmaker I, I I quite admire. But I think at his worst, I think Wes Anderson just has actor like cool looking actors walk in slow motion while he plays you know a classic song that evokes an emotion to you know ninety percent of the audience, and you know that can be beautiful and sublime, and it can also be really easy to do if you can afford that song, you know. Right. 
like, so for Adam and me, we didn't want to have any songs in our films that people could like be like, oh, that's the song that was playing at like that party in college where I threw up on myself. Now I'm not enjoying this movie. Um, we always were trying to dig deep. Uh, Anna Neal is credited as a music researcher on the guest. She's just a friend of ours who helps run a record store in my hometown. Um, but, but, you know, we knew that we wanted to lean towards kind of goth industrial music initially. It ended up being more of a synth wave thing, which is just our personal sensibilities. And I should say, I, uh, Adam and Anna really mostly picked all those tracks. I wasn't too involved with the guest. It was really just Adam sending me songs and me being like, yeah, this is great. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we try to not license music that we think other people have heard. Um, to this day, if I'm looking at a song, I'll go on like Spotify. And if it has like over 2000 listens, you know, it goes on the B list. Um, and, uh, you know, in Sicker Man, who composed the music to Seance, you know, I, I, I just an amazing artist uh, and I, I think it's gonna really blow up. But honestly, one of the reasons I wanted to work with Sicker Man is because I felt like he was unjustly unknown. You know, he had this amazing album with Serengeti, um, but you know, like he's, he, you know, I knew that he was such a versatile musician and I'm really excited for people to hear the music to Seance because I think it's a really different score um, and really like cool and interesting, um, but you know, specifically, part of one of the reasons I wanted to work with him is because I, I knew that people would be discovering his work and they wouldn't be coming to it with say the prior associations that they might have um, towards, you know, a junkie XL or whatever, who I couldn't have afforded anyway. Um, so there's that. That was definitely a good answer. Fede, hi, I went with the creative, with, hi, I went with the creating content route and made an indie self-finance for a feature. Any advice on navigating the festival service submissions of all? By the way, we missed the deadline for Fantasia. Well, you blew it, Fede. Uh, sorry to hear that. Uh, you'll have to wait another year. No, I mean, festivals Festivals are how you primarily sell films. And I've been very lucky in that, like to this day, the way I, I am able to basically survive is mostly off the films that I've sold at festivals. Um, Blair Witch paid a decent amount, but I mostly turned down studio work because I don't spend any money and I live very frugally. And the reason I do that is because well, A, I grew up really poor, so I'd be uncomfortable living any other way. But also, uh, I don't want to have to, like, the thing that my success has afforded me is the ability to, to, to pick, to work with good people, to pick my projects, and so on. And that is it, by the way. Like, like when you succeed, at, you know, don't imagine there's ever a finish line to this stuff. Like, Adam and I were never, like, popping bottles when your neck sold. I mean, for one thing, it sat on a shelf for two years and then came out after the purge. Um, there is not anything ultimately to celebrate except our own folly, as is so often the case. But uh, you, truly, we've never celebrated anything, to my knowledge. We talk about how we're going to celebrate things, but then by the time you get there, you're just like, what's to celebrate? I mean, the guest is perceived as a success now, but, but one of the reasons we were so eager to take our, the Blair Witch job is because, you know, we certainly didn't perceive the guest as a success from the start. It didn't sell. Uh, for, you know, it sold, it sold a picture house, but, you know, it wasn't a huge sale. It wasn't, it didn't take care of it. And then it, it made like $3 in theaters. Um, so we, we, and it didn't seem like people really liked it that much either. So we kind of thought the guest was this massive failure and we needed to pivot. Turns out the pivot was the massive failure that everyone was mad about and they loved the guest. They just didn't want to spend money to see it. Totally get that. But it, it was, it's a funny thing, you know, you look at our career and it's like, well, why'd you guys do Blair Witch after the guest? It's like, we agreed to do Blair Witch while we were doing the guest because we were like, oh shit, we're fucked. Like, we're not going to we're not going to be allowed to make another movie because uh, cause this, this one is so weird and, um, and people hate it because uh, we didn't do your next again. And then it turned out people didn't hate it, but too late. Um, you know, movies take a long time. So, so sometimes the logic behind you know, someone's career choice isn't always that intuitive. Old scripts will bubble up from years ago and it looks like this is something I'm doing now, but, but you know, maybe not, maybe, maybe it is. Um, so, you know, so the festival, I don't know, the festival scene is, is a hard one to navigate, but, but like, uh, you know, I really don't necessarily have any advice. Um, don't be a jerk, like be really polite. Like you should be doing that anyway, um, just cause it's probably like important as a human um, but yeah, I mean, like, 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 you know, put yourself out there and, and be, be kind. And, and in my experience, festival programmers do watch everything. Like they do watch it. Um, it's why they are such tortured people. And it's why they will like really rave about a movie that is like pretty bad is because they've damaged their brains. 
um, by watching all your favorite movies. Um, but if you can surprise them with like a good one, you can really get their attention. And, and I mean, that is, that's Adams in my career, you know, um, like, like we would not have a career if it weren't for festival programmers being like, you know what, these, these weird, like kind of redneck guys, uh, actually seem like they, they, you know, they're trying something like, like, you know, let's, let's, let's give them a shot. Um, so, you know, I don't really have anything specific to, for that. I'm sorry. Um, I'll, I'll think of, if I have anything else for that, I'll, I'll post it. Much more moderate. You got some of you write more from a fan. Okay. I do think you always should write, uh, knowing what your audience for a film is. Again, I am talking specifically about festival audiences here. Um, cause that is a market. Oh, and I'll have to wrap this up in a half hour because I want to watch that time when he's going to be detention that's playing at seven your time. So I'll definitely wrap this up before detention, everyone, because uh, I think I played the video game and uh, it, it looks spooky. Um, so, so yeah, like I, I do think you should always write with an audience in mind. I do think you have to respect that. I think, you know, at the end of the day, I try to write specifically with an understanding of what a viewer would expect and want from a film. Because I think the first thing movies kind of have to do first and foremost is, is live up to what the audience wanted from it and then exceed that. But the first thing, which I think a lot of filmmakers forget is that you do have to deliver. Like if someone is, you know, taking it on their one night off a week, they're gonna spend, you know, $15 for a ticket to see your movie. They do want, to be you know entertained and, and if they've been promised a horror movie they want it to be scary and if they've been promised a comedy they want it to be funny and then if you can do something subversive or experimental on top of that that's really the goal right like that's that's really like what makes a film great but i think a lot of people try to kind of skip the first part which is i get why audiences were disappointed by horror boy to die um actually i get why audiences are pretty mad uh occasionally at every film i've, I've been involved in um and I think it's actually been kind of helpful for me <laughs> to, 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 to hear that from people, you know, because again, the guests, people like it now, but, but, but that was not, you know, like, like I remember uh, running into a critic buddy of mine in line at Sundance um, and he was just like, hey, I gotta be honest, I hated the guest. I was like, oh, that's cool, man. Like, don't sweat it. That's fine. Like, we know it's not for everyone. Um, but, you know, but, but we, you know, who was the audience in that movie? It really was kind of us and we kind of knew that which is why we were trying to do something that we thought had a huge audience, which is Blair Witch, which is why you probably shouldn't be taking my advice on any subject. Um, if, you, if you write more for a fan audience, if you have your mind, if so, would you drop a planned storyline A to change the story towards a new unexplored B if you see a character heading more naturally towards it? Yeah, look, screenwriting is its own unknowable process. Um, I don't outline unless someone pays me to do so because I find that I tend to write from a viewing perspective. I tend to like to know what my endings are and I tend to write my endings first because then I don't have that terror of the blank page. Usually by the time I get to that ending, I completely uh, want to change it. But then I kind of start at page one. So I, I feel like I have a bit of a template for writing the ending first. So I'm not just facing pure blank, you know, and a void of creativity. Uh, but uh, at the same time, there's that sense of like, like, like when you're writing and you're creating something, you're approaching it as a viewer a little bit, which is you reach the end of the scene and you're kind of like, what do I want to happen next? Like, what, like what's, what's this character going to do next? And I do think that sometimes needs to be an organic creative process um, of discovery for a screenwriter. So, so I, I actually hate outlining. I will only do it because studios uh, and producers will often, often want to know what I intend to write uh, before they pay me to do so. Um, and this gets to a kind of a larger question. I'm just going to say I answered that. Done. Um, this gets to a larger question of spec scripts um, and whether it's kind of better to spec something out as a script uh, and have a finished screenplay rather than like a pitch of an idea. Well, I mean, obviously the way I'm going with this talk, sorry, is, is you know, the more of a final finished polished product that actually entertains uh, the person who's consuming it, you know, the better position you're in. Um, I couldn't get anyone to read my scripts, but Adam and I could get them to watch A Horrible Way to Die, you know. Um, and, you know, that was not a no-budget movie. That was, again, about an $80,000 film. But but we could have, you know, we could have done something for less. And Adam was doing stuff for less. It was just not opening the right doors. So, I, you know, I tend to think you should always take things as far as you can. Um, 
I still tend to spec out most of my projects spec out. That's such an obnoxious thing to say. I tend to write most of my projects um, without asking people to pay me for them first. The reason for that is that I want to, if, if, I, if I fuck up and I go off the rails and, and realize I kind of can't finish it, the guest kind of notoriously started out as this, uh, notoriously to like three people, I should say, um, the three people who care about this, uh, at least one of them is in the room with me being, um, but, um, but like, I would say like, um, more or less, you know, the guest was a project that I started one way, realized I didn't like what I was writing, scrapped, and then started a different way, you know, after chatting with Adam a bit more about kind of Halloween 3 and Terminator 2 and stuff, um, you know, that kind of gave me a different approach than the much more dramatic, much more serious approach that I've been taking, which would have been maybe more, you know, I don't know, politically valid, but but no one would have seen it. You, I, I would have been preaching to a, a choir of zero because, you know, people don't generally like being preached to. Um, although, you know, movies do occasionally go in that direction um, successfully. But, uh, you know, but I think it takes a lot of talent to do that. I'm not sure I have it. So, uh, so you know, so I, I do still tend to just write all my scripts myself, see how they go, and then try to sell them. I almost always fail. Um, all of your projects, you should just look at them, visualize all your projects like baby sea turtles. Like you want them all to get there. But like some of them are going to see the streetlights and think it's the moon and it's just not going to happen. And, and, and I know that, like I have, I'm not going to show you because I'd have to like pan and you see what like that this room is. I, this, I moved to a new place and then I went off to make a movie and then there was a pandemic. So I don't have anything on my walls. It's going to look really nice in like a year. Um, but uh, my, so my room's a little depressing. But anyway, I have a bunch of post notes on my wall right here which are all the projects that I should be working on. Um, there are currently uh, six of them, but there actually should be seven. I haven't put one up yet. Um, but, uh, but, and they're the, the, those are the six projects that I should be writing. Um, you know, one in six might get made. I hope all six will get made. I believe in all of them. I'm dedicating my life to them and, and you know, but what are the odds, you know? Um, you know, Adam and I have developed so many projects that you'll never hear about. And this is why the frustrating thing with I Saw the Devil is honestly, we have so many other projects that haven't happened that, that some of which I'm really proud of. Um, uh, Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead are really big fans of one of our unmade films in particular. They, they, they continue to harass me about it, which is nice. It, it means a lot. It'll never get made. But, um, but, you know, like, like we have, um, you know, we have all these projects that, that we can't get made because even though Adam just did, you know, a, a, a $170 million huge movie, you know, that doesn't mean that he can get my weird stuff financed. Um, you know, so, so just kind of always know, you know, that, that like, you know, some of the things are going to reach fruition only if you like physically push them there. So, you know, so I, I, I tend to still spec out everything even though I really need to stop saying those words because I just feel like such a, uh, um, I still tend to write everything for free because that's how I've always done it. No one has ever really paid me and to write. And, uh, and to this day, I think the only film that has actually been made that I was paid to write, like, like was probably Blair Witch, um, which again, everyone is uh, still pretty mad at me about. Um, what was your involvement with Temple? I'm not going to get into that. I wrote a blog entry about that. That was it, it, the, the, the honest uh, truth is that, uh, you know, it was, an old, it was going to be a collaboration between myself and a friend, JT Petty, very good filmmaker, did the Burrowers, Sandman, Software Digging. Um, I did a draft as a favor because I was not in the WGA at the time and it was like a very low budget project. And years later, uh, you know, that draft was, was made into a film without JT's involvement, even though it was very much all his ideas. Um, and, you know, I, I wish everyone involved uh, the best, but I had no involvement in that and I haven't seen it. Uh, and I probably won't. I definitely answered that one. Any advice on self-distributing low budget movies online? <sighs> no, I don't know anything about that. Um, I, I do know that like, it, it, it seems like a good idea, uh, but I also see movies just completely vanish um, and, and other movies kind of thrive. Um, I don't know about self-distributing. It, it feels like it's hard to get things out there. I, I, I tend to feel like you'd be better off trying to find a partner. Um, and if you can't, you know, then, then there are avenues. Um, you know, I have bought movies uh, that are self-distributed over things like, you know, 
Vimeo and, and, and so on. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's tough if you're not, if you don't have like a built-in fan base, like someone like the angry video game nerd, you know, when he did his movie, it was a Vimeo rental. I don't know why that was the first thing that just came to mind. But, but the point is he can do that because he's got 8 billion followers or whatever. Um, and if you don't, it, it, it's tough. I, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. So uh, I'm going to say that I answered that one, though. Uh, the scripts you wrote that were felt were misunderstood. But, oh, I can't answer that. I can't answer that one. Uh, would I ever reopen? Of course. You know, but like some mentoring writers, Adrian asked me, would I reopen to uh, mentoring uh, Black and Indigenous people of color, personal color writers? And I have mentored writers. Not one of them is professionally working as a writer, I think. Um, they are all still kind of working day jobs because I'm probably a bad mentor. I do my best. I try to give notes. Uh, I never had a mentor. I, 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 did, I did like a spoke at USC and ever since then I've somehow been in the USC mentorship program. And so every now and then I get these USC students asking me to mentor them. And I'm like, well, first of all, you just spent a bunch of money on USC. So like, I already, I, 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 I feel like we're a little, you know, in, in, in the red here. Um, but I, you know, it's tough. I, I, I'm, I'm, you hear, you see what I'm, you see me mentoring right now. I, I, I don't know who wants more of it. Um, but I mean, you know, I, 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 I've never said no to mentoring someone when they've asked, cause it's such a flattering thing to ask. And I do want to help people because I did struggle, uh, you know, in my own career and, and, you know, I, I, I did grow up, you know, like, like working class or, or, you know, poor or whatever you call it. And, you know, like, like living with my mom, I, you know, it's like we were on welfare and stuff. And I felt like I didn't have access to, to anything I needed. You know, all my friends were in bands and I was trying to write scripts and it was just felt, you know, absurd. And so, so, so I do try to mentor people, but I, I don't think I'm good at it. And, and, and I don't, Maybe if I get more successful and, and I can actually like really get to a point where I can say like, you know what, like I can bring you in the writer's room on this, you know, like this is good, you know, and I can start actually giving people opportunities, um, which I think is largely what people are really asking for, of course, you know, when they ask me for advice is they really just want me to say, the script is amazing. And I know these producers and they want to finance it and we're going to production in six weeks. So, you know, fly out to LA. And I wish I could say that, um, not, specifically, I guess, because I haven't necessarily read anything that would prompt that. But even if I did, you know, it, 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 I, I, I don't necessarily have those resources. I can get scripts to producers and managers. And I, I do have a lot of friends who are, you know, very powerful and successful. Um, but, it, you know, it's not that simple. Um, so, you know, so, so right now I kind of don't know what I have to offer as a mentor. Um, you're taking a DIY feature approach. Ah, I've already answered that. Yeah, I, I so Lights Out, which uh, is referenced by Dave here in his question, is probably the most influential short film of our generation, right? Like, like or since like La Jete or something. Because um, because Lights Out cracked the code. I'm referring to David uh, Sandberg's uh, amazing short film with the woman standing in the hallway and then there's a jump scare. It's perfect. There's no dialogue. It makes its point very quickly is purely entertaining, instantly rewatchable, instantly shareable, instantly like marketable hook. And I've seen so many people try to crack the code on what he achieved. And, you know, it's just like Blair Witch Project or Paranormal Activity or, you know, I couldn't tell you how many times Adam and I would go to these meetings and people would tell us that they wanted the next Paranormal Activity. Well, yeah, of course you do. Of course you want the next $10,000 movie that makes, you know, a billion dollars that you can turn to a billion dollar franchise. But the next paranormal activity, the only thing you know about it is it's not going to resemble paranormal activity, right? It's going to be something new and different. Um, I mean, paranormal activity itself, you know, I was at the world premiere at Scream Fest in 2007, 2009. It showed at Slam Dance in the kind of the new cut or a different version and got picked up. And, you know, I guess Spielberg and, and, and Steve Schneider and Jason Blum kind of made some changes and it turned into this massive thing that resurrected found footage as a sub as a subgenre. But like, what are the vagaries of fate there, you know, to, to, to this, you know, like real estate guy achieving his like found footage horror vision, um, you know, and, and it actually being good. I mean, at the screening I went to, again, the world premiere of Paranormal Activity, uh, Oren like was there, but I think he wasn't talking to anyone because he was too shy. And like, like, you know, the 30 people in the theater, I was with uh, Mike Williamson and Brian Collins, I think, and we were like, that was awesome. Um, what the hell? 
you know, like, like, and, uh, you know, and, and it, so even that, like, like, you know, dodged failure so many times on the way to success. So, you know, I, 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 I think, you know, there's so much of a desire to be the, the next lights out right now among horror filmmakers, because, you know, if you can get a horror film, you know, that's that simple and sublime a hook, amazing. But I kind of think, you know, it, it, it's it's it, it's a right place, right time thing, which isn't to say that the film isn't great. I it's a great short film. I, I really like that movie. I, actually, I, I mean, it really is very good. Um, he's, you know, I think I think David Simmer is a, a really good director. Um, I, I actually love uh, that Annabelle uh, sequel that he did. Uh, that's just like a, like a jump scare delivery system. Um, it's just like one of the most like jump scare relentless films I've ever seen. Uh, you know, I, I, very talented filmmaker, obviously. And, you know, it's, 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 it, what is the next version of that? It's like, all I know is it's not probably going to be that. And the chances of something like that happening, most short films don't work as features, uh, inherently. A good short film kind of doesn't hold up as a feature, um, for the most part, uh, you know, extrapolating upon that narrative concept is only going to dilute it. Um, I, I, you know, so I don't know, you know, the short, the, the, like, I don't know that like the shorts to feature path is, is a successful one. I, I personally think that, do, that, that you should just make a feature. I, I think you should just dive into features. I think if you have a sublime short film idea, you should make it. But I think if you have a feature film idea and, and your feeling is like, well, you know, I'm better off doing like some kind of sizzle reel short version of this, Again, a lot of people have been very successful with that. Films do get made that way, like I, like I've kind of emphasized in this amazing, amazing talk. Um, Hollywood executives are more likely to watch your short than to read your script. That's very true. And and people like Hollywood likes pre-existing things. So understand Hollywood as a network of people who are all worried about losing their jobs. And the number one thing that can cause a Hollywood executive to lose their job is if they make a movie. Um, really like know that because that is really true because uh, because if they don't make a movie and they can just kind of lay low and hunker down and have their name on enough kind of things they can have a long lucrative career uh, but if they make a movie then they've extended themselves and if it fails they're done so they need to have a way to cover their ass right which is why everything in Hollywood is based on something so you might say to yourself like well what is the built-in audience for like a speed racer feature or, or or something like that. Well, it doesn't matter because they don't actually really analyze. I don't know why I'm picking on Speed Racer, but it's an interesting example actually, because because I think most people agree that um, it's a it's a remarkable film. Um, the Wachowskis are you know obviously like like brilliant, um, and the movie does you know like like could have changed cinema um, in a weird way, uh, though maybe not for the better. Unclear. But I mean, I I, I can watch Speed Racer pretty endlessly. Um, uh, depending on my sobriety but you know like no one was analyzing the audience for this they were analyzing the awareness of it because that's a way to cover your ass right if you're an executive and then someone says well why the fuck did you make this way you say well look at it like it did this and this person said it was good that's why it's much easier even on a just basic human level to, to make adaptations and franchises because they have a built-in safety. Hollywood's always looking for an algorithm. That's why we're always trying to turn people like, um, you know, interesting actors like Aaron Johnson and Jake Gyllenhaal, you know, and like Prince of Persia. We're always trying to turn them into movie stars, even though they're just actually good actors um, because Hollywood wants a star system so desperately. Hollywood love a time when they could just put a person in a movie and that movie would, you know, guarantee money. The last person that was probably true for was maybe Adam Sandler. Uh, you know, obviously there was an era of in the 80s with like Van Damme and Seagal films where they were kind of the auteurs of their own films. But like Will Smith, Tom Cruise, you know, the, the true movie stars. But that doesn't really exist anymore, even though everyone tries to pretend it does because it, it's lucrative for them. But really no one, you know, movie stars legitimize films is what they do. Uh, the audience sees a movie and they go, oh, that's a real movie with that person who I like in it. But that's not necessarily going to get them to the theaters anymore. Um, you know, it, it, they maybe won't go to the theater if there's not a movie star in it. So that that's the value of a movie star. But they're not going to go see it because of a movie star for the most part. 
Um, but Hollywood is always trying to do that because then they could justify their choices. And that's why original stuff is the riskiest. So you're really asking people to, to, to take a risk on something you know, with a spec script. That's why short films, the shorts to features pipeline does work because Hollywood executives can say, oh, but everyone loved this short and there was a huge bidding war for it. And that's because it's a pre-existing thing that makes people feel more safe and secure. Um, and, and so, you know, so look, that works, but I would only do that if you had it. If you have a lights out, great, I'm jealous, uh, make it. But don't try to force your feature into a short film box is, is my advice. If you got a feature, make a feature and, and just do it cheap, shoot it on an iPhone, shoot it on whatever you've got, shoot it, find an interesting way to shoot an iPhone. There are interesting adapters actually. Um, and, and just do it yourself. I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna go until the tension starts, I guess. Uh, um, screenwriter, oh, screenwriting contests. Well, okay. Basically, I kind of pitched this talk online as like, look, I don't have any good advice. I don't know anything about anything, but I'm better at least than probably most of the people who claim that they know what they're talking about. Um, and that is still how I feel. I don't know about these script contests. I do know that, you know, obviously if like a blacklist or a Newbery fellowship, you know, there's some huge ones that do matter, but I kind of think like outside of the huge ones, they don't make a difference. And, and I understand again, the appeal of these things. I entered a few screenplay contests, um, you know, I think when I was pretty young, uh, certainly my scripts were not good enough to win. I actually think Dead Birds, I might enter Dead Birds in something where it was like, a finalist that kind of rings a bell, like some free horror one that I entered or something. Um, it, it is not what got Dead Birds made. Um, so I, I don't know. I tend to think screenplay contests, I, I don't want to like disparage what might be an altruistic endeavor for a lot of people, but I, I tend to think a lot of them are just people making money. And, and I think you have to look at like the entrance fees. And I, I'm, I'm inherently very suspicious of online script judges and online script consultants. And I'm hesitant to talk too much about that because I think it's very easy to say like, well, you know, you're saying that from obviously a position of privilege, having already established yourself as a screenwriter, you know, so, so where's your good advice? Well, that's a, actually a really fair criticism. So I, I'm hesitant to say, don't enter screenplay contests, they're all a scam, blah, blah, blah. Some of them aren't, some of them are. Um, I would say, look at them see if any films have really been made from them um, and, and really don't spend money on anything that, that, that hasn't, that doesn't seem worth it. Um, Cause I, I, unfortunately I do think there's a market uh, just kind of inherently in getting people who are desperate to have their scripts read to pay to have their scripts read. Um, I already said notes. Um, look, never say no to a note. Kimmy kills zombie. This is, this is the question I already talked about notes. I have a rule of thumb, the improv rule. I never say no to a note. Um, even if I am screaming inside. Adam Wingard is the best at this, which is why he's making huge movies. He is really, really good at sitting in a room. And I've heard Christopher Nolan is amazing at this. I've heard Christopher Nolan is actually like the best. I've heard like Christopher Nolan can sit in a room and you can sit there and be like, like, well, what if, you know, instead of time travel, they all could jump really high. And Christopher Nolan just be like, hmm, interesting. You know what? I'll, I'll, you know, I'll take a look at that. And, and that's... That's what you should always say to a note. Because again, there's something there. And in, in my experience, the note might be wrong, but the problem does exist 99% of the time. You know, uh, I obviously haven't been too complimentary to studio executives over the course of this talk, but the truth is I have many that I'm friends with who I love and think are brilliant people. And, you know, if they give me a terrible note, it's because there's something that's off. And even if a, a really bad executive or bad producer, and I've had the opportunity to work with them as well, obviously, um, gives you a terrible note, you know, they're, they're identifying something. So go in, make it better, and then say, hey, look, I tried that. And, uh, and uh, again, 99% of the time, they'll be happy because maybe you didn't do exactly what they asked you to do, but you did address it and you did change it. So 99% so of the time when I get a note I hate, I say, mm, okay, you know, that's interesting. I'm not really sure how that'll work, but, you know, something like that. I'll take a look at it. And then I always do. I, I, and I think that's part, that's important. Um, I, I'm being sincere. And, and then I do take a look at it and, uh, and I make whatever changes I think are best, but I, but I try to be really hard on myself and I try to really try 
uh, and, and 99% of the time when I come back and I'm like, hey, I didn't do the thing you asked me to do, but I, I did kind of address that. Like, what do you think? 99% of the time they're happy. The 1%, you're gonna have a tough experience. Um, but another thing is another person asked me, by the way, um, how do you handle notes from multiple producers that are creatively incompatible? That happens all the time. The honest answer is uh, you <laughs> side with whoever you agree with, if you can get away with that. If they're creatively incompatible, you go with whatever one you like more, that's obvious. If two, if two producers are giving me conflicting notes, I'll just pick the one that I like, uh, the note that I like. And then, uh, but obviously you have to take a lot into account there. And generally what I ask them to do is I talk to them about it. If there's a team of producers, you know, this happened a couple times, uh, actually even on Seance where, you know, it was a very low budget independent film, but I had financiers and, and, and there were a couple times when they weren't on the same page. And then I just kind of said like, hey, can you talk to each other? and get on the same page and then come back to me and let's have a conversation. This is all in the editing room. And, and that always worked out fine, you know? So, so, you know, just act, you know, 99% of stuff in Hollywood can, can be kind of solved by acting like a human being. But because again, our industry tends to attract mostly psychopaths, uh, you know, that is a rare talent. Um, how do you see COVID quarantine impacting the way we tell stories in the future? To be determined, Becky. Oh, you know, there's five minutes till detention. Move to LA. There's no reason to move to LA. I'll answer Becky's question. Don't move to LA anytime soon. Um, Cause I think uh, there's kind of no reason to be here. Um, well, there's definitely no reason to be here right now. Um, I strongly discourage people from visiting Los Angeles uh, currently. Um, although, uh, you know, it's quite nice when it's not on fire. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I don't know how COVID's going to change our industry. But but I can skip to Drew's question. And say, stay in your hometown. There's no reason to not make movies. Make movies where you have people who can help you make movies. Um, I, I really mean that. Uh, I'm scrolling through because I want to watch Detention, and I, I imagine some of you do too. You can all leave. I won't be offended. Um, Yes, write based on budget, based on what you have. Um, I do think you should write your scripts based on what you have. Like, don't be writing scripts that you can't afford to make. Uh, I really do believe that. Like, like, like a script is a blueprint for a work of art. Uh, I say this as a as a writer. I say this as a writer who like won't take in a film by credit as a director because I think they're like disrespectful to like non-directors. So that's how much like I respect the craft of screenwriting. I respect it a lot. I think a script is not in itself necessarily a work of art. Maybe a play by Frederick Durenmaat or, or Sartre or whatever, but but my scripts are blueprints for, for, for something that I intend to create. I say work of art, um, work of whatever, you know, entertainment, but but a script is just a blueprint. And at the end of the day, that's kind of the number one thing that I wanna emphasize is don't fall in love with your script it is a blueprint to create something bigger and better and like i don't think you should write anything that you don't see how you can get it made unless it truly is a passion project and you truly just want to get it out of your heart and just be like this is my fucking script and i'm proud of it and maybe in 20 30 years i can get this made obviously i don't want to prevent anyone from working on their dream project write whatever you're passionate about fuck writing sucks and it's hard and it's miserable and it's lonely and you know and now that i'm old i can't even do it drunk all the time so that's a further handicap um you know so so whatever it takes to get you to typing you know the end um whatever you're passionate about whatever you love write it but i'm passionate about making movies and i suspect most of you are too i suspect you're not passionate about writing so much as you're passionate about filmmaking so, so write what you can make, you know, if you aren't a director, you know, there are a lot of people out there who are, um, and, you know, and, and right now, you know, for a long time, that was a field that was, you know, largely, uh, you know, open only to white men like myself, that conversation is changing very gradually, um, you know, and things are, avenues are opening and, you know, it's not going to happen fast enough to make anyone happy but but i think you know i think you are better off in the current market like like thinking about what you can get on a screen um and you know and and 
you know, it's hard. It's fun. It's a fun challenge. Like write something that's just a few people in a room. I mean, that's what I love about, you know, the Duplass brothers and Greta Gerwig is, is, you know, they weren't getting cast in things. No one was casting them. So they started making movies just so they could act. I mean, that to me is really cool. And now like the Duplass brothers are a fucking industry and Greta Gerwig is probably like, you know, one of the 10 biggest filmmakers in Hollywood. And, and you know, like, but they all kind of started doing what they were doing because no one was casting them. So they just got a camcorder out and they're like, all right, maybe like we're in a relationship. Like, 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 let's work on that. <laughs> and, and I really do respect that. Now, does that mean I necessarily want to watch those movies? No, they're boring. But, but they could, they went on to make much better ones. And that's the point. Uh, I think I'm going to end my talk now. Mitch, can I end my talk? Is anyone still here? Uh, Jean-Francois, is this the end of my talk? I mean, my talk's like gone late, hasn't it? Is anyone still here? Is, is my talk over? That's what I want. So Mitch, is my talk over? Should I end my talk? Favorite K-pop band. I'm really ignorant about K-pop. Uh, I really am. I'm sorry. I wish I could. I wish I could get down. I know it's like a cool thing, but I'm like, I'm old. I'm old. I missed it. I, 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 I couldn't. I couldn't tell you. Um, uh, I don't. Um, all right. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna scroll through. Um, did horrible? Did I have a different ending at Fantastic Fest than what the eventual home video version showed? No. <laughs> But I did write a much darker ending, uh, also to your next. Actually, pretty much all my scripts have, have initially really dark endings that, that then we realize are somewhat cruel. Um, so, so this, you know, this is a discussion of audience empathy and, and how people react to different things. So, so um, originally, a horrible that I had a much darker ending, uh, very similar to the original ending of your next, where basically everyone died. Um, and because uh, I, I, you know, growing up, my uh, my favorite novel was, uh, and then there were none. Um, the, the much more problematically titled, uh, and then there were none um, in, in other parts of the country. Actually, Dan Stevens was the first person who, who was like, oh, you know what that was like originally called, right? I was like, oh, shit. I didn't know that. Um, anyway, my favorite book growing up, and then there were none. Loved it. Was just obsessed with it. I was, I was a huge mystery person. I, I, when you see Seance, you'll see this, because I grew up reading like Nancy Drew. I was obsessed with Nancy Drew. I was obsessed with the Nancy Drew case files, because that was when they would... Like people wouldn't die or have sex in them, but it was kind of implied that they might. So when I was a little kid, that was like the racy shit. And, um, and so I read like a lot of Agatha Christie, a lot of Dorothy Sayers. Um, that was just the fiction that I loved. I read all the Babysitter's Club books for some reason. Uh, I just read a lot of weird stuff and I love that kind of stuff. And so I always kind of wanted to tell those stories. Um, and uh, Your Next was my attempt to really do And Then There Were None. And uh, we realized really quickly on set that the performance Sharni was giving um, it would be really punishing to the audience to, to kill her character. Um, at the end, the cop was going to shoot her in the head, kind of like at the end of the original ending, get out. And then the accident hit him in the face. And the police would find, you know, 16 dead bodies and no explanation. That is funny. But then you realize watching the movie, it's like, well, it's not funny anymore because you actually care about this character because Sharni's doing such good work that actually for her to go through all this and just get shot in the head would actually be not funny. It would be mean. Um, and that was kind of what we concluded with the ending of A Horrible Way to Die. It was just, it was just like too dark and, and punishingly dark uh, and, and as angry and depressed as we were when we were making A Horrible Way to Die in Your Next. And we were quite angry and we were quite depressed. Um, we weren't that angry or depressed. We wanted our audiences to, to, to enjoy what they had watched. Uh, and in the case of one of those films, I guess we did okay. Um, so uh, interesting question. Um, uh, writing process, I am a disaster. As a writer, um, I every year I think I'm gonna be better at it, but I procrastinate relentlessly and I spend all day procrastinating and trying to find like the exact combination of like caffeine and snacks um, and occasionally marijuana, which rarely helps with writing, just FYI. Um, sometimes helps with editing actually. Weed helps with editing because you can get high and watch your movie and suddenly realize how fucking long it is. Um, that's something I recommend. Get like a really good paranoid, like sativa high going, and then just sit and watch your movie and just be like, oh fuck, I can trim the fat on this. Um, but writing, it's a little hard because you have to have that confidence um, in yourself uh, to keep going. Uh, and so, um, so yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm these, these six post-it notes, uh, 
I'm not ahead on these projects. I'm behind on these projects. I'm, I'm still a neurotic disaster as a filmmaker. I have no advice. I read these books by Stephen King where he's like, well, I get up every morning at eight and I have my coffee and then I write from nine to 5 p.m. And after I've finished my 12,000 words, you know, I do 50 push-ups and then I go like, you know, make love to my wife and spend time with my family. And it's like, yeah, it sounds fucking nice, I guess. Yeah, all right, cool. Nice bragging. But I am not capable of that. I can only write when my brain wants to write, uh, which tends to be you know, three in the morning sometimes, um, when I've literally procrastinated the whole day away. And now I'm like, okay, it's three in the morning. I really should get to bed. So I have to write something. Um, and it's stupid because, you know, as, whenever I make my fingers type, you know, they do pretty good work, but I still just have that insecurity and, and depression and self doubt that we identify as writer's block, which is, of course, just the fear that whatever is in our head won't, won't, won't translate to the page. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, I'm gonna keep going through this list. So my writing process is really neurotic and fucked up. Um, sometimes I'll spend 18 hours a day writing, but much more often I'll spend zero hours a month writing. I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not, I'm not well suited to be giving advice about this stuff. Um, the only way I'm maybe well suited is that when you read those like, Stephen King books or when Robert Cargill, who I'll pick on because he's a good guy, when he's on the internet being like, like you, you know, in the time you read this, you could have written two sentences, write your script. Like you can come up with a script in the end of the month. Well, he's right, he's correct, but, <laughs> but uh, he's 100% correct. Uh, and, and you should listen to him and not me because I'm over here just like, I don't fucking know. Yeah, you should be writing all the time. Yeah, I should be writing all the time. Shit, I should be writing right now. I don't know. It's tough. You know, I just have to kind of wait for the inspiration. I have a hard time particularly writing horror during the day. It feels like it should be written at night. Um, a lot of people have good ideas. That, um, thank you. Uh, you know, um, so people are asking me specific stuff. Okay, I think I, I think I, oh, BTS. Um, I think I'm going to call it. Uh, I think I want to see if I can still watch Detention. I think I might have missed it. Um, but, uh, but thanks so much. Um, it, not the Joseph Kahn detention for people watching this on YouTube five years in the future. Great movie detention. Uh, the Joseph Kahn version. Not sure about this new Taiwanese version. Let's go check it out. Um, all right. Oh, I have three minutes. Okay. Thanks everyone. Sincerely thank you if you've watched this. I don't know. I really, truly, truly hope I answered someone's question. It really does bother me to get people asking advice because um, not, not, not that it bothers me in a bad way, but because I feel like I don't have an answer. Um, and, and I hope that these kind of ramblings and, and addressing some of these things, you know, I'll kind of try to keep, you know, maybe, maybe I'll come back and do another one of these for Fantasia someday in the future, because I, I do feel like, you know, there is such a, a, a dearth of knowledge out there. And I do think, you know, people in the industry uh, would be better off kind of, I, like, like, I don't enjoy much less than talking about my own films. I'd much rather actually be talking about your films and other people's films, as you've probably gathered. I don't have much to say about my films. I kind of like for them to speak for themselves. Um, and I say my films, meaning the films that I've worked on, obviously they're not like mine. Um, but, you know, like, uh, I, I, do, I do think, you know, there should be kind of more, um, you know, attempts at this. So, so I'll keep ideally by people smarter than myself. So thank you so much uh, for sticking around. I really appreciate it. I'm going to leave and we're going to end this now.